Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You've got to have a dream. <laughs> You've got to have a, a vision. You have to be able to see something other than what you've seen and what you've experienced. You have to look at the word of God and say that can happen to me. That can happen to me. If that can happen to anybody, it can happen to me. Now, I have four scriptures I want to go over with you on the mind because your thoughts become your words and your attitude. Your thoughts become your words and your attitude. How many of you understand that? What a man thinks is what he becomes. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Where your mind goes, the man follows. Somebody out there has been listening to me, I can tell. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. Strip yourselves of your former nature. <clears throat> Put off and discard your old unrenewed self. Now he's saying, okay, you, you have a new nature, but now you have to put off the old nature, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusions. Delusions are lies that Satan tells us that we never bother to learn enough truth to refute those lies. And be constantly, everybody say constantly. And be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. Turn to the person next to you, smile at them so they don't get mad at you, and say, get your attitude renewed. <laughs> I don't know, that's far too funny, and I'm trying to be very serious. Now let's look at the next verse because this always amazes me. And put on the new nature. Remember he started by saying put off the old nature. And now he's over here saying put on the new nature. So he's actually over here saying stop living like you're not saved. Start acting like Christ. But what is the bridge to get there? Be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. So you're never going to change your life. You're never going to change your behavior until you change your thinking. Yes, I said you change your thinking. Now, we do nothing without God's help. God gets all the credit for any success that we ever have. Apart from him, we can do nothing. But neither is God going to do everything for us without us joining him with a faithful effort, leaning on the Holy Spirit, certainly leaning on the Holy Spirit, knowing we can't do it alone, but being determined that we are going to work with the Holy Spirit to be the person that God wants us to be. So you have to learn how to think right, and you have to learn that you can think whatever you want to think. You don't have to think just whatever falls in your head whenever it falls in your head. You can choose your thinking, and you need to do so carefully because what you think is what you will become. Amen? Let me tell you something. You can dress it up and put paint on it and take it to church, and you can shout and holler with all your Christian friends, but God knows what's in your heart. And God sees what goes on behind closed doors. What if our minds suddenly became a movie screen for everybody to see? Hmm. I thought you might feel that way. Every day, every day keeping your thoughts right is a battle. That's why we call it the battlefield of the mind. I'll never stop teaching on the mind and I'll never stop teaching on the mouth. As far as I'm concerned, I probably should do one series every year on both, and I don't care if it's the same thing. Every time I do it, we need it. Yeah. Invariably, those are the teachings that people vote for as number one choices on television. Those are the teaching CDs that people get, the teaching DVDs that people get, the books that people buy. We know that we have trouble with our mind, but we have to stop just wanting some outside force to come and make us think right. So if nothing else, 
Do me this favor. Do yourself this favor. Do God this favor. And start thinking about what you're thinking about. There's so many people out in the world whose lives are in just total, a total mess. And they don't ever think about what they're thinking about. Stop a few times a day and ask yourself, or when you get to work, ask yourself, now what did I think about all the way to work this morning? What, what did I think about when I was in the shower this morning? And here's a really good one. What did I think about those few minutes that I laid in bed before I got up this morning? Oh, that's an important time because I'll tell you what, the devil makes a bid for your mind early before you're completely awake. He certainly doesn't tell you how hopeful you should be for the day and how you're forgiven for yesterday's mistakes and how much God loves you. But you can tell yourself that once you know it. And one of the things you can find out is that when the devil is talking in your ear, you can speak out loud out of your mouth and he'll have to shut his. You have to learn how to talk back to the devil. Don't ever run at your giants with your mouth shut. When David ran at Goliath, he was telling him and prophesying what was going to happen. This day, I will cut off your head, and I will feed your carcass to the birds of the air. You come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen? We need a little more boldness. Now, Colossians 3, 1 and 2 are favorite scriptures of mine. They tell us to set our minds and keep them set. So, let me just, let it just suffice to say that your mind, if you're operating in the mind of Christ, is so powerful. So powerful. And you have a choice. You can go all day in the mind of the flesh, or you can choose to go with the mind of the Spirit. You can learn the Word of God to such a degree that, I mean, just as soon as bad thoughts come in your head, you may find yourself starting to roll them over and over, and then you think, nope, 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 not going to think that. Well, Joyce, have you ever gotten to the point where you don't have to cast down those wrong thoughts? Nope. I don't have as much of a battle with it as I did 30 years ago. Not nearly the battle I had 30 years ago, but for some reason, I don't know if it's because we're just not fully awake or we've not completely engaged our will yet, but I have to be especially careful like the first 15 minutes of the morning. Good, I got one other person that has a problem. I mean, I'll find myself in my jammies making my coffee just thinking about what's wrong with everybody I know. <laughs> Come on. But you know, the good news is, is I don't have to be like that all day. The minute the Holy Spirit convicts me, I'm like, nope, and I will start rehearsing what their good points are. I don't need to think all day about Maybe the two things are the one thing that somebody does wrong when they do 99 things right. And I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. I'm not even like that. That's not even me. I'm a very positive person. I really love people. I'm very merciful. So I know it's the devil. I know that. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high and lofty thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity under the obedience of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. Your mind is the battlefield. But this set your mind and keep it set, it's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful scripture because it pretty much means once you make your mind up, come on now, I mean, once you really, once you really, really, really make your mind up, you can do anything. I mean, anything within the will of God for you, you know. I'm not going to say just because you decide to, you can have the next number one hit song. 
anything that God tells us to do, we can do if we really set our mind and keep it set. You see, a quality decision is not one that you make in the height of emotions. It's easy to start on a diet when you're full. No more needs to be said, amen? But only the people who have made their mind up will stay on the diet to get past the hunger pains that will come for a while. Not forever, for a while. So anyway, I don't have time to go into all the different things that we can set our mind about, that we need to set our mind about, but you can apply this to anything in your life. You can get out of debt if you really set your mind to. You can save money if you set your mind to. You can get enough exercise to stay alive and not have a heart attack when you're 40 if you set your mind to. Y'all love that, didn't you? Well, Joyce, you just You can learn how to be compatible with somebody that you're incompatible with. Woo, hallelujah. I know, I've been married 43 years to a man that is totally different than me. We're different, Dave and I are not. I mean, he loves sports, I don't care anything about sports. I mean, if it bounces or rolls, Dave loves it. And I mean, you heard me tonight, it's like, so what sport do they do in here? What, you know, I don't know. I mean, if people couldn't stay married because they were incompatible, we would have lasted about three weeks. So you just got to make your mind up. How many of you need to make your mind up to some stuff? You can overcome any kind of bondage, any kind of addiction, any kind of broken past if you just get with God and say, well, this is what has happened to me, but God, but God is on my side. Romans 12, 2, I think we're all probably pretty familiar with that, but it says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, entirely changed by the complete renewal of your mind. Changing your mind, changing your attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and perfect and acceptable will of God. God provided everything in the promised land for the Israelites. But they were never going to prove it out. They were never going to feel it, see it, use it, if they didn't get their minds straightened out while they were still out in the wilderness. Where are you at in your journey? How godly is your attitude? How quick do you forgive when somebody hurts you? How easy do you get offended? What kind of a giver are you? When I talked about the offering tonight, did you get an attitude? Or were you excited about giving? The first bad attitude that the Israelites had, really a hurtful attitude to them, was that everything in their future was determined by their past. They had a slave mentality and I would imagine a pretty poor self-image and they just kept wanting to go back to Egypt when there was nothing in Egypt worth having. They spent years begging God to get them out of there. Then everything difficult that they came up against, they just wanted to go back there. They had no dream, no positive vision for their life. They knew where they'd been, they knew where they were and they didn't like either one of those. <laughs> How many of you know where you've been and you didn't care for that and you know where you are right now and you'd love to see some good changes there, but you know, you've got to have a dream. <laughs> you've got to have a, a vision. You have to be able to see something other than what you've seen and what you've experienced. You have to look at the Word of God and say, that can happen to me. That can happen to me. If that can happen to anybody, it can happen to me. 
God is no respecter of persons. If he can change Joyce, he can change me. If he can heal anybody, he can heal me. Amen? Don't always think it's for somebody else and then sit around and be jealous of them because they've got what you'd like to have. <laughs> I'm planning to. Stick around. We're going to dig into that one really huge on Saturday morning. Psalm 27, 14. Let's look at what David said. What, what would have become of me had I not believed that I would see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living? <laughs> Hopelessness is the absolutely most worst, horrible place that you can be. Hopelessness is terrible. I've seen the eyes of hopeless women in many places of the world who are so hungry and so poverty stricken that they can't feed their children. I've seen that hopeless look and it's, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Everything about you becomes down and sick when you have no hope. But I love what Romans 4 verse 18 says about Abraham. You know, God brought Abraham out away from everything he was familiar with because he had something that he wanted to do in him. And you know, sometimes before God can get to you what he wants to get to you, he's got to get you away from some of the influences in your life. God told Abraham, he said, leave your father's house, and leave your home and all that you're familiar with. Why? Well, because if you study it, they were idol worshipers. <laughs> and God had a plan for him and he wanted to do something in him. It's very important who you spend time with and who you hang out with. Now, I'm not saying you can never be around an unbeliever. Matter of fact, I think we should be around unbelievers. But you better make sure that you're affecting them and they're not infecting you. You got to know when to draw the line and when to say enough is enough. If we hide in all of our little religious groups and never get out in the world where people are needy, then that's not what God wants us to do. But I love what the Bible says about Abraham. He went through a lot and God gave him a promise of having his own child. And when he got that promise, he was, I think, 90 years old and Sarah was real old and she'd already had to change a life and to put it plainly, he was impotent. And God said, oh, I'm going to give you your own baby from your own body. <laughs> well, Abraham laughed the laugh of faith, but Sarah laughed the laugh of doubt and unbelief. <laughs> when you're thinking about the promises of God and what the Bible tells you you can have sounds really impossible to you. Do you laugh that laugh of faith and say, boy, this is really going to be fun. I'm going to have a good time watching this happen. Or you go, <laughs> good things happen to everybody else, but not me. And Abraham waited 20 years after God spoke that to him. 20 years. And in Romans 4, it says, all human reason for hope being gone. Abraham hoped on in faith that he would be the father of many nations just like it had been promised him. Have you lost your job? Have you lost someone in your family that you love? Are you the product of a broken relationship? Were you abused in your childhood? Whatever. Have you had a rough time in life? Are you sick and you've been sick so long that you're sick and tired of being sick and tired? Don't, don't stop hoping. If you have no reason to hope, you need to hope. <laughs> Go ahead, look at your stupid circumstance and say, I have no reason to hope. But don't stare at your circumstance. Glance at your circumstance and stare at Jesus. Looking away from all that will distract unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of your faith. 
We look at our problems and talk about them way too much. Amen? They thought that everything in their future was going to be determined by their past. And it didn't have to be. Everything was based on what they could see and what they knew. No eyes of faith. Yet the Bible says in Isaiah eleven three that Jesus didn't judge by the sight of his eyes nor the hearing of his ears. <laughs> he had something in, totally different. We need to get our spirits in tune with the Spirit of God. We need to learn more about spiritual discernment and a lot less about what we see and what we hear and what we think we know. God is a spirit and he deals with us in our spirit. And sometimes there are things that I feel in my spirit that I should do or shouldn't do and I just know that it's right or if I don't do it, it's not going to be right. And my head can argue and I can come up with many reasons and I can find enough excuses to set it aside. But you just feel yucky when you don't follow the Spirit of God. So you can be yucky in the wilderness, roaming around and around the same mountains, or you can learn how to think right. You can set your mind in the right direction and you can say, I am going to the promised land. I am not going to spend my life talking about it. I am going there. I am going to live there. And with God's help, I'm going to have everything that Jesus died to give me. Amen. Amen. You know all the scriptures, letting go of what lies behind, pressing on to the good things that are ahead. All kinds of scriptures like that in the Bible. If you're someone here tonight and you don't know those scriptures, you might want to write down Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Find yourself a Bible and and read it. Never mind, I'm going to put it up on the screen so you can see it now. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. Do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. Get your mind off the past. Stop thinking about what everybody's done to you and how unfair you've been treated and just think about God's double blessing. You can have double for your trouble if you hang out with God. Let's see the rest of it. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Not I might, I could, maybe. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it, and will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness, and I will make rivers in the desert. All the Israelites ever saw was their circumstances. They were the most grumbling, murmuring, fault-finding, complaining, blaming bunch of people that I've ever seen. I mean, they had a bad attitude. Bad attitude. It wasn't their ites. It wasn't the Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Hivites, or any other ites. It wasn't the bossites, the husbandites, the wifeites, the kidites, the trafficites, the economyites. It was their attitude. It stunk. Now, I know that's not your problem. But maybe you could buy this teaching CD for somebody you know with a bad attitude. <laughs> or maybe you could get all your bad attitude friends and bring them back for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> and maybe those watching by TV, you could call all your bad attitude friends and tell them to watch the program tomorrow. Because I'm sure you're thinking right now of 100 people you know that need this. I remember when I kept asking God why I wasn't happy and finally he said, you're selfish. I also remember the day when I was praying for God to make Dave change. He said, Dave's not the problem. <laughs> Listen, I guess I just dish it out the way I've gotten it from God. You know, I'm just one of those meat and potatoes persons, give it to me straight. So God gives it to me straight and I'm giving it to you straight. You're never gonna live in the promised land with a bad attitude. Well, the good news is that your past does not have to determine your future. Today can be a brand new beginning for you. You need to, however, think in the right direction. Don't look behind you, look ahead. You know, if God wanted us looking behind us, we would have eyes in the back of our head, but they actually are in the front 
which is a sign that he wants us always looking forward. The way you look forward is in your thoughts.